How many of you guys remember as a kid having to wait for something? How many of you enjoyed it? No, it sucked, didn't it? It was horrible. I can remember as a kid, my parents would tell me, your birthday's coming in a week. That week took a freaking month. It did. Yeah, and, and, and what about Christmas? I can remember as a kid watching the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, and I kind of passed that tradition on to Megan. She loves to watch that parade. But you know what got me with that was that I waited for three hours to see Santa Claus. And then I realized I had to wait over 30 days for him to come to my house. And I'm thinking, this is horrible. I remember as a kid, it felt like the month of December took a year to go by. I can remember one time at the Woolworths, downtown Portsmouth. How many of you remember the Woolworths downtown? <laughs> That's Roger Brown's now, right? Uh, I remember being in there and walking out the back door, and for whatever reason, they had a parking lot in the back then, and, and there was a house, and I remember people putting up a tree. You could see them putting the tree up in their big bay window upstairs. It was an upstairs apartment, and I remember thinking to myself, Santa Claus is coming tonight. That was about the 5th of December, <laughs> and I kept waiting, and I kept waiting, and every night he wouldn't come, and I was waiting for him to come, but I was worried because my parents hadn't put up our stuff yet. <laughs> And then I remember that when we got our tree up, and we had a tree, we had an aluminum tree. <laughs> How many had an aluminum tree? We had two two trains running around it, but it was an aluminum tree. And then my brain went to, as soon as the tree's up, Santa's going to come. Well, that tree went up like two weeks before Christmas. So for two weeks, that's my little, that's a, my son, my, that's my little grandson back there. For two weeks. Two weeks every night I'd go to bed thinking Santa Claus was going to come. I didn't figure out that what was going to And then we get to Christmas Eve. And Christmas Eve, we'd always go over to my grandma and granddaddy's house who lived across the street from us. And every year I would think, well, well, maybe Santa will come while we're over there. And I'd come back to the house every year with this anticipation that Santa Claus had come, and he ain't come. <laughs> I hate waiting for stuff. Do y'all? Well, you know what? Between the time the prophets predicted that Jesus would come and Jesus came was over 400 years. Can you imagine waiting? Can you imagine? 20 generations passed between the time they said he would come and the time he showed up. So uh, they had to wait a lot longer than I did. I, I, I'm just telling you. I got to tell you something. I'm excited. We're starting a brand new series. And... and I love the Christmas story, and I love the Christmas carols. I, I love putting lights up on the house. I love decorating. I think it's so exciting. It's really cool. Once we get the decorations in the house and the decorations on the house, we don't turn lights on in the living room anymore. We just let the tree be the light, you know? And that is so cool, and I just love it. Every year, I just love Christmas. I love the story. I love the cookies. I love the food, right? Do y'all like, is it just me? Okay, I just wanted to make sure, you know. We're talking about the single event that changed the course of history, the fact that Jesus came. That's an amazing thing. I remember as a young pastor working with Pastor Jim, I was so frustrated every year. Because every year he got to do a Christmas series. He got to preach four sermons about Christmas. And then he'd come up to me and say, hey, Steve, can you cover for me next week? I'm going to be gone, right? And that was always the week after Christmas. And you don't preach about Christmas after Christmas. It's ridiculous, right? And, and then when I became the pastor for, for Compass, I had this bright idea to do Christmas at the movies. So I didn't get to preach that either. And so here I am as a pastor. I've been a pastor now almost 25 years. This is the first time... I get to do a Christmas series. So clap if you want to. Y'all are screwed because you got to listen to me for four weeks, okay? you got to listen to me for four weeks talk about Christmas. And I'm not real excited about it. Yeah, uh-huh. Okay. Hey, but it is a brand new series I'm starting. I'm calling it, last week I didn't know what I was going to call it. I'm calling it a Thrive Christmas Jesus is coming. Amen? 
And what we're going to do over the next four weeks is build up to Christmas Eve. God is so cool. He made Christmas Eve fall on a Sunday this year. So we get to build up to it. And this morning you got to listen to one of the songs we're going to sing on Christmas Eve morning, Joy to the World. And each week you're going to hear one of the songs we're going to do. And I think what you're going to see is more instruments get added also. Because our goal is when we get over in our building in February to have a band. That's our goal. So we're going to be moving towards that. So I, I want to look at Christmas from a different perspective because we all focus about the manger itself. And one of the things I think a lot of us forget about are the prophets who foretold the story. You see, the, the announcement of Jesus' birth, like I said, came 400 years before he was born in that manger. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to look at what the prophets had to say. I want to show you what the prophets had to say about this baby that was going to be born in a manger. It's so important because these people are seldom ever associated with Christmas. They really are. I mean, we quote what they said, but we don't talk about who said it or anything like that. It was the prophets that told us where to look for Jesus. It was the prophets who told us under what conditions he would be born. It was the prophets who pointed the way to one particular day in one little teeny wink, one horse town called Bethlehem. It was the prophets who did all of that. And it was the prophets who talked about the birth of a baby that would fulfill everything else. Sadly, the Israelites didn't listen to the prophets. Well, they, they, choose, they picked and choose where they wanted to listen to. And they really missed the whole story. They missed the whole story. So if you got your outlines, let, let's jump right into it. <clears throat> First thing we want to talk about are who were the prophets? Who were the prophets? So I want to begin by looking at the prophecies and the prophets who made them. And what I want to do is look at who they are, clarify what exactly a prophet of God is, and what role each one of them played when they were called by God to tell this story. So a prophet, first off, was a person who's selected by God. You don't get to get up one day and say, I'm going to grow up and be a prophet. Doesn't work that way. Prophets were selected by God. They were appointed by God, and they had one role. And that role was to speak a message to God's people. Not any message. Exactly word for word what God told them to say. They became God's spokesman to God's people. Now, a lot of people think a prophet and a priest are kind of the same. They're totally different. Totally different. Because you see, priests in those days were people who were mediators between God and his people. So if you want to look at who was a spokesman, priest were God's people's spokesmen to God. They were the people that would go talk to God on behalf of the people, okay? That's what a priest did, and that was like a position they held. A prophet, on the other hand, was actually a function. It was a unique calling to be delivered in a unique way, exactly as God wanted, wanted it said. Now, the prophets were called on to speak God's word just as it was, it was given. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. This is God speaking. He says, before I formed you in, her womb, in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now, if you read a little farther in that chapter, it's not in your outline and it's not up here on the screen. God said, you must go to everyone I send you to, and you must say whatever I command you to say. So when you read that, there's little room for doubt that, that God called Jeremiah to be a prophet. Little doubt whatsoever. God said, here's what you're going to do, here's who you're going to go do it to, and here's how you're going to do it. So the purpose, like I said, of the prophets was to deliver a message from God, from the one true God. And typically, when God called prophets, it kind of fell into some themes. Most prophets were called to do one of several things. Either, number one, to encourage obedience to God. This isn't in your outline either. To encourage the people to be obedient to what God was saying. Number two, to get people to turn towards repentance because they had done something wrong. They had gone in the wrong direction. They had, a, they had gone against what God asked them to do. So the prophet came and said, you need to repent. You need to repent. If they didn't repent, then the prophet was sent to warn of judgment. 
God's going to judge you. There's going to come a judgment. You're going to be in the middle of it. They, they were sent sometimes to encourage trust in God and to remind the folks that God was the one that was ultimately in charge. And no matter what the message was the prophets gave, there was always hope built into it. God is going to judge, however. God wants you to turn because, and you fill in the blank, every time there was a sense of hope that if you did what the prophet said, God was going to bless you. If you did what the prophet said, God was going to look favorable on you. Now, there's clear evidence a lot of times that when a prophet rolled into town, people got freaked out. And I, I would get freaked out. Oh, God, he's coming to tell us we've done wrong. God's going to kill us all. He's going to send out a bolt of lightning. And, and that happened a lot. The Bible says that when the, the, the prophet Samuel arrived in Jerusalem, uh, and basically he came for the one purpose of announcing and anointing David as king, it says the people in Jerusalem freaked out. They just didn't know what to do. They were scared to death because they thought for sure they had done something wrong against God, and the prophet was coming to tell them that they were going to get in trouble, you know. But, but and that always came because a lot of times when the prophet came, people really didn't want to hear the message, you know. I mean, if the prophet came all the time and said, you guys are amazing, God loves you, he thinks you're doing a good job, that, that's not what the prophets usually did. They really usually came and said, you guys got a problem. You're not listening to God. You've got to turn from you. And all of a sudden, you know, time and time again, that becomes something you don't want to really listen to. You know, so when the prophet rolls into town, people just assume God was displeased with them. When the prophet rolled into town, people just assumed they were going to preach doom and gloom. So they didn't really like seeing the prophet show up, okay? So, uh, and there was also these people that were running around that the Bible calls false prophets. They were people who claimed to be speaking from God, but in reality, they weren't at all. In fact, their message wasn't to turn people towards God, but to turn people away from God. So a lot of times the people had to distinguish, is this a prophet from God, or is this a false prophet? So they had, they had to figure that out. And actually, they put together what, what I think is a good litmus test. They actually put together a test for the prophets. If you are a prophet, like you say you are, you're going to meet this criteria, and I put it in your outline. Number one is they're going to speak in the name of the Lord. They're going to speak in the name of the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 18 says, The Lord said to me, what they say is good. I will rise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. God says when a prophet speaks, he speaks in the name of the Lord. You see, the prophet's always aware of who sent him to give the message. The prophet always knows whether or not it came from God. And it was so important that when, they, when the prophet spoke, people need to understand they were speaking in the name of the Lord, which means it's just as if God was speaking, just as if God was saying it. The second test is this, his prophecies must be fulfilled. This is a pretty important one. This is a pretty important one. Deuteronomy chapter 18 says, If the prophet speaks in the Lord's name, but his prediction does not happen or come true, you will know that the Lord did not give that message. That prophet has spoken without my authority and needs not to be feared. Well, let me tell you what. The Jews even went farther than that. If you said you were a prophet and you spoke something that was supposed to happen next Tuesday, come next Wednesday, you were dead. You were dead because they feared God, okay? Now, the prophets were smart. They talk about stuff happening years from now, so they got some time, right? But some of the prophets came and spoke about immediate judgment. God is going to do this tomorrow, okay? Some of the prophets came, and what they spoke about was things that would occur many, 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 many years down the road, which is the case with Isaiah and Micah. You see, Isaiah and Micah are the two prophets that God designated to foretell the story of Jesus. And they were talking about things that were going to happen 400 plus years away, you know. All right, number three, his prophecies must be in agreement with all previous prophecy. It can't run counter to it. This is the most important thing. Deuteronomy chapter 13 says, if a prophet 
or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a sign or a wonder. And if that sign or wonder spoken of takes place and the prophet says, let us follow other gods, gods you haven't known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow, and him you must revere. Keep this command, keep his commands and obey him. The prophet's got a claim to speak God's words. If, if, if the words he speaks don't fall in line with the rest of God's commands, doesn't fall in line with the rest of God's law, then you can rest assured he's not speaking from God. And those were the test of a, of a prophet. God's word must always be consistent with one another. Understand this, guys. God will never contradict himself. A lot of people say, that's a bunch of contradictions in the Bible. It's not true. If you really open God's word and you really study God's word, you come to realize there's not a contradiction in Scripture at all. God's word does not contradict itself. It always is consistent. And that's the true test of a biblical prophet, whether or not what he says lines up with what God has already done, what God is saying. If you look at the index of your Bible, I'm going to give you a little history lesson real quick or a Bible lesson real quick. If you have a Bible, most of you have an app or, or, or a hardcover Bible, a real, real Bible, and you look in the index, you're going to find the prophets that Jesus quoted the most. As his three years of ministry on this earth, he quoted prophets like Joshua, Judges, from Judges, from Samuel, and Kings, as well as some other references to prophets in other books. And those are what we call the major prophets the major prophets. And then there's a bunch of books in the Bible from Hosea to Malachi, which those are known as the minor prophets. And the reason for that is not because they were lesser. It's because they didn't say as much. They didn't prophesy as much. That's the only reason. And so, so we have to understand who the prophets were, that they were God's spokesmen, that, that he was speaking to, they were speaking to his people. They were called by God. They were sent by God. And they were given God's message to speak. So that's the first thing we need to understand about the prophets, okay? The second main point is what the prophets said. The second main point I want to cover is what the prophets said. This is so important because they had much to say. They had a lot to say. And when you start reading the prophecies from the prophets, it's fascinating. Uh, and you get to see, we 2,000 years later, we get to see how those prophet, prophecies were fulfilled through Scripture. You know, how God actually fulfilled what he said he was going to do. And there's literally hundreds of fulfilled prophecies that are in Scripture. Now, the fact of the matter is, one of the most prophesied about events in all of history was the coming of the Messiah. And here we sit, getting ready to roll right into the Christmas season. And I think this is so important because prophets prophesied that there would be a Messiah. They prophesied about his, his birth. They prophesied about his life. They prophesied about how he would live as an adult. And they prophesied about his death. They laid it all out. And then Jesus literally fulfilled every prophecy except one that was ever given about him. Do you know what the one is he hasn't fulfilled? That he's coming again. I'm going to tell you what. If he fulfilled the 60 major prophecies he, 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 would, he fulfilled, you can believe he's coming again. Okay, now here's where it gets kind of kind of touchy a little bit. The last prophecy about the Messiah was given 400 years before his birth. So literally God was silent for over 400 years. And there were a bunch of people running around claiming to be the Savior, claiming to be the Messiah. We don't talk about him a lot because they weren't important. They weren't. But literally... There was probably somebody in every town saying, I'm the Messiah. And you know what? Is it possible that some of those people could have, whatever their life was about, could have fulfilled some of the prophecies that were called out about Jesus? Sure. Sure. It was possible. But let me tell you something. It is impossible for any human being to fulfill all the prophecies about the Messiah. Okay? I want to prove how impossible it is. I found this material from Josh McDowell. I wish I could claim it as my own. I can't, okay? Josh McDowell wrote about a professor, and this professor's name was um, Dr. Peter 
W. Stoner, write his name down. I want you to look. Remember, I tell you, don't believe anything I say. Go prove it for yourselves. Okay? This is how you get into the Bible and how you start to learn. Um, Peter Stoner, now let me just give you his credentials. He was, he was chairman of the departments of mathematics and astronomy at Pasadena College. He was the chair of the science department at Westmount College. He was professor emeritus of science at Westmount. He was professor emeritus of mathematics and astro astronomy at Pasadena City College. And he did an analysis of just eight of the 60 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled as the Messiah. Looking at eight of them, okay? And his analysis was reviewed, studied, and approved by the American Scientific Affiliation, which is a big deal in the science world, okay? Here's what he, his study said. He stated that the probability of just eight of the prophecies being fulfilled in one single person was the number one to, to the 17th power. One times 10 to the 17th power which simply means the odds of one and one followed by 17 zeros. I don't know. I can, that's, that's a Steve, okay? That's a, I can make up a word. That's a Steve, all right? Whatever it is, right? Okay, that makes absolutely no sense to me because I'm a visual person. But Josh McDowell said, here's what that means. Ready? Josh McDowell explained it this way, and I'm just going to read it to you because I'll screw it up if I don't, okay? He says, if you had that many coins and you spread them out, Pennies, by the way. They would cover the entire state of Texas two foot deep. Okay? Now, take one of those pennies and mark it with a Sharpie. And throw it as hard as you can into the pile. And then for seven days, stir the whole pile with a big stick. Be a really big stick. Okay? Then, after seven days blindfold yourself and walk for three days and bend down and pick up one coin. That's the odds of you getting that coin. One to one to the 17th power, okay? That's the same probability that one man would fulfill eight of these prophecies. And Jesus Christ fulfilled 60. 60. Say it with me, 6D. That's amazing, guys. That's amazing. And you can't do that unless you truly are the Son of God. You can't do that unless you truly are the Messiah of the Old Testament. You can't do that unless you truly are the one that God was pointing to to save the world. That in itself is amazing. And you know what? God wanted to make sure we understood that. That's why there are so many prophecies about this one person. God wanted to make sure that we didn't miss it. And all these prophecies come from Isaiah and Micah. There's a message. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. You heard this on Charlie Brown Christmas. <laughs> Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. <coughs> First question we've got to answer is how is he going to arrive? Isaiah says that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Now, this is so significant. And I've got to say, sadly, I am seeing now that evang evangelical pastors are blowing off the significance of the virgin birth. Why? Because unchurched people can't wrap their brain around it. It's not that big a deal. Let's leave it out. Do you understand if we leave out the idea of the virgin birth, then Jesus of Nazareth is just a man. He's just a man born of a man. But the Bible clearly says he would be born of a virgin conceived by the Holy Spirit. That's who Jesus was. And people are just blowing this off. He would no longer fulfill one of the major prophecies about the Messiah. And therefore, he couldn't be who he claimed to be. Now, we, you can't downplay this, guys. 
true. Jesus had his humanity through Mary. That's what gave him the ability to be man. But he had his divinity through the Holy Spirit. That's what gave him the ability to be God at the same time. He was both man and God. Now, and he had to be to fulfill the other prophecies. Here's why. He had to be a man in order to die on a cross. But he had to be God in order to rise again. He had to be both man and God. The second thing we find from Isaiah is, is who he is, who he was. Isaiah says he's Emmanuel. He's Emmanuel. He shall be called Emmanuel. And everybody, a lot of people know what that means. God with us. That's what it literally means. God with us. This was to be God taking the form of a man and dwelling on earth with man. And you know, before this, God had always interacted to man through priest. And what God was choosing to do was eliminate the priest, come to earth, and interact with man himself. That's so powerful. And this child will be called Emmanuel, God with us. Now, what's he going to do? What's he going to do once he gets here? Isaiah chapter 9. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time and forever. Isaiah gives us a picture here. He lays it out. Some of the roles that Jesus is going to play. Some of the roles that this little baby in the manger is going to play. Number one, he says he's going to be king. He's going to be king. He's going to reign over David's throne. He's going to reign over his kingdom. And this claim is what caused many of the people to miss the true Messiah. This claim that he would be king established in the minds of the Israelites that he would be a mighty king, that he would be an earthly king, that he'd be somebody like David, that this, this Messiah would come and restore the glory that was Israel during the time of David. That's what they thought. That's what they thought. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that's not why he came at all. The Bible also says, Isaiah says, he's going to be comforter. Wonderful counselor, comforter. He's going to be somebody who understands what we go through, who understands what we feel, and he does that through his humanity. Understand what it means to grieve. Understand what it means to be excited or sorry or, or guilty to understand those things. He's going to be God, mighty God. Isaiah once again points to the fact that Jesus will be God, that he will be God and he will reign in, mighty, in, in might and in majesty. Isaiah also says he's going to be eternal. He's going to be eternal. He says he's the everlasting father. He's going to reign forever and ever. And so that, that in itself is amazing. And that he's going to bring peace. That the Messiah is going to bring peace of the increase of his government and peace. There will be no end. The Messiah is going to usher in an earthly time of peace on this planet and deliver them from captivity. This is all the things they were thinking. They were thinking that's what he's going to do. And the fact of the matter is he was coming to restore us to himself. He was coming to bridge the gap between man and God to help us be able to be restored and reconciled with a holy God. And, and, and it talks about where he's going to arrive. God spoke through the prophet Micah for this. He said in, in Micah chapter 5, But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. He's going to be born in a small, insignificant, one-horse, podunk town, okay? And literally, let me tell you what this is kind of like. <coughs> President Trump and Melania coming to Portsmouth and having a baby. <laughs> How ridiculous does that sound, okay? Or, or we could say it would be um, um, Harry and what, who's Harry's fiance in England? What's her name? Megan, yeah, them coming to Portsmouth and having a baby. That's what we're talking about here. God 
was going to come to earth through a virgin in a place called Bethlehem. Most people didn't even know it existed. It was such a little teeny town. But it was going to be the site for the most amazing event of all of history. And Micah foretold that centuries before. And you know what? The name Bethlehem has significance. A lot of people don't connect the dots here. The word Bethlehem literally means house of bread. What Jesus called himself the bread of life. There's a significance there. The Messiah who is going to be born is going to be born in a place called house of of bread. So, so the prophets came and they gave us the place that he was going to be born. They gave us the way he was going to be born. They gave us the roles he was going to play. They gave us a glimpse into the events that would unfold through the Christmas story throughout history to eternity. That's what they did. The prophets had spoken and then all of a sudden they went silent. God didn't speak to them again. He chose to be silent. And this was a tough time for the Jews. A lot of people don't walk into this, but I went back and pulled out one of my, my Bible history books from Bible college and went through this. Now, there's a lot of things that, that I'm going to talk about when we walk through this, but uh, uh, part of it I found through just looking at, at some of my textbooks. But let me give you the third point. The third point is how the message of the prophets was received. This is important. How the message was received. Jesus sums up their response in Matthew, in the New Testament. Jesus said, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before me. In, ver in chapter 23, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who killed the prophets and stoned those who sent, who sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, and you were not willing. See, the Jews have a history of, of, of mistreating and ignoring the words of the prophets. That's why God had to send so many. That's why God had to pronounce judgment on them, because they ignored what God was saying to them through the prophets. They failed to listen to his prophecies, and as a result, they missed the blessing. They missed the blessing of the Messiah. They missed it, you know, and you would think they'd be watching. You would think they would read Isaiah. You would think they would read Micah and say, okay, okay, we got to watch. We got to pay attention. This is something that's coming, yet once again, they missed it. Now, to understand how they missed it, you need to know a lot about their, their history. And let me lay this a little bit of this out. This is, um, this is not all of it, but at least sometime, something you'll be able to understand. God goes silent, and then all kinds of things start happening to the Jews. Okay, Alexander the Great became the, the ruler of Rome, and, and he had risen to power, but you know what? He liked the Jews. He liked the Jews. So while he was in power, the Jews were given literally every opportunity and privilege that a Roman citizen would be given. They could go to the schools in Rome. They could take part in anything that was going on, watch the arts. They, they were just, it was an amazing time during Alexander the Great. In fact, people flocked. They moved there because of how good it was under him as, as king. But at the end of his reign... Jerusalem got invaded and overrun by Syria. And Syria was pretty rough on, on the Jews. They took them into captivity. They destroyed things. They just, they said, you can't worship the God. You can't do anything that you want to do. You can't do it. You've got to follow the laws of Syria. And that was hard on them. And, and, and literally, they desecrated the temple. And so the Jews were waiting for God to intervene, but God was still silent. God wasn't saying anything. And then after that, the Jews were invaded by Herod the Great. And when Herod the Great invaded, it was a long, it was a bloody battle. I can't remember how many thousands of Jews died fighting to try to protect Jerusalem. In the end, they were overrun by him. And he was even different uh, from anybody else. He said, you will worship me as God. You're going to worship me as God. So you can imagine being persecuted like they were. He destroyed the temple. 
He required them not, that he did not allow them to, to obey any of the Jewish law whatsoever. They had to listen to him. So you can imagine what was going on. We give them a hard time because they missed the Messiah. But can you imagine being a part of what was going on during that time? I mean, they were oppressed. They were beaten down. Family members were, were being persecuted and killed. It was horrible. It was horrible. And all the while, they figured God ain't doing anything. But God was moving behind the scenes, orchestrating what needed to happen for the coming Messiah. The whole time this was going on, he was doing that, but they thought God was silent. Any of y'all ever feel God silent? How about last week? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's so many times when, when we feel like God's not hearing us. He's not answering our prayers. He's not listening to us. And so... Let me tell you an amazing thing. I told, I told the, the third team this morning. Let me tell you an amazing thing happened to me this week. I even put it on Facebook. Uh, I had horrible pain in my, in my gum, you know. And I didn't think to pray about it. I was trying to think, what can I take to make this go away? And I was taking everything in the, in the, I mean, from Mucinex Max to Sudafed to, if you take 20 or 30 ibuprofen, the pain will go away, but your stomach gets all jacked up. Trust me. <laughs> but it was horrible, and it got worse, and it got worse, and it got worse. And Dawn said on Wednesday morning, God prodded her at 4.30 in the morning, woke her up, and told her to pray for me. I didn't know it. I got up. I went to St. Leo, and my, my gum is throwing. I don't even, I remember it was hard driving to school. I got to St. Leo, and I'm setting up everything for testing that day. And all of a sudden, about 8 o'clock, I realized my gum's not hurting anymore. I mean, literally, I have no pain whatsoever. And that blows us away. And I'm writing on Facebook how God's answering. You know why? Because it feels like God doesn't answer prayer a lot. So when he does, it's an amazing thing. The one thing we need to remember is when we don't hear him, we think he's silent. He's moving. The song we sang this morning, God is on the move. He's always moving. Even during this 400 years of silence with the Jews, God was orchestrating everything to get it ready for the coming of the Messiah. So God broke the silence when a baby was born and he cried. That's when the silence was broken by a baby born of a virgin to a mama and a carpenter who was like, okay, I didn't do this. I don't know how it happened, but I'm going to go along with it. Can you imagine being Joseph? <laughs> Guys, a, a, a virgin, huh? Conceived by the Holy Spirit, huh? But you know what? Joseph was a mighty man of God. He said, okay, okay. If you read that, that, that account, he thought about putting her away privately, getting rid of her, divorcing her. But the Holy Spirit prodded him to hold on and wait, and he did. So here you got a baby in a manger, a cow trough, in a public town called Bethlehem, born of a virgin and a carpenter father who's going, yeah, I didn't do anything, but I, I, I'm going to be his daddy. I'm going to step up. I'm going to be baby daddy. I'm cool. <laughs> and the Jews are crying, where's God? Where's God? There in a manger. Jews needed the Messiah to come, but they didn't want him to come the way he came. They didn't want a baby in a manger. They wanted a mighty man of God to stand up to the persecution. I was talking to the guys back in the production room this morning. I said, they'd have loved it if General Patton had showed up. <laughs> that would have been amazing because he wouldn't have took no crap from nobody, right? That's who they were looking for. They weren't looking for a baby in a manger. All the time, God is crying, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. He came to bring something that Israel didn't even realize they needed. And that was the blessing of God. The gap to be, be closed between them and God. And a guaranteed eternity with the God that created them. They had no idea, no idea whatsoever, whatsoever. All right, I know I'm running late. Oh, wow. Um, I've only got about two more hours. We're good. Um, I do want to. I want to end with three things that I want you guys to remember. Three things that I want you to remember. Number one, 
there's still a message to proclaim. There's still a message to proclaim. And that message is Jesus is coming again. Say it with me. Jesus is coming again. Like the prophets in the Old Testament who pointed towards the Messiah in a manger, there's still a day to come when Jesus is going to return to this planet for his people. And that message needs to be told. That message needs to be told, folks. The second thing is there's still a need for prophets to proclaim it. There's still a need for prophets to proclaim it. Now, who are the prophets today? Dun, 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 dun. Who are the prophets today? Dun, dun. What? You and I. Right. You and I are God's spokesmen. Why? How can we stand and say that boldly? We are God's spokesmen. Why? Because he's given us his word. We have his word. All we got to do is read it. Everything anybody needs to know about Jesus coming again is readily available in God's word. We are supposed to be believers. We are supposed to read God's word. You're not supposed to wait for me to tell you. Don't ever trust a word I tell you. Go read it for yourself. Only when it becomes personal to you will you embrace it. You hear me, guys? Only when it come, becomes personal to you will you embrace it. And when you embrace it and it becomes personal, you've got to tell people about it. We are God's spokesmen. There is a message to be proclaimed, and we're the prophets that are supposed to proclaim that message. Number three, there's a world who's looking for salvation and desperately needs to hear that message. There's a world that's looking for salvation and desperately needs to hear that message. Like the nation of Israel, there are so many people right here in the city of Portsmouth that are in bondage. There are so many people that are in despair this morning. When you guys work with us with Mercy Drops, when we walk on the streets of Portsmouth, Duane was talking about the care packages for the packing party. They're going to pack 1,000 packages. We give out 100, 100 every Monday. That's how many people we see that are homeless. And these people are in bondage. These people are desperately in need of Jesus. They're desperately in need of it. There's a whole city here, and we need to deliver the message of salvation. We need to say that Jesus has arrived. We need to say that the Messiah has come. We need to say God loves you and wants you to be a part of his. I'm excited about the next several weeks as we walk through the Christmas series. Uh, I really want to make sure, and I was telling the, the surf team this morning, I don't want us to get wrapped up in the stuff of Christmas. Because it's so easy. I mean, this morning, there were, there were technical difficulties that I have no idea about. I, I, I walked into the production room at one time, and Pastor John is just like he wants to pull his hair out with the computer. God wants us to focus on the reason for the season. I know that's corny, but he wants us to focus on the reason for the season. Satan wants to distract us, and he'll use stuff like this, stuff like you, stuff like work. <coughs> Stuff like stuff to distract us. And what I want for the first Christmas at Thrive Church to be a church and a Christmas that's not distracted. To be a church who focuses on that baby in a manger, understanding God's gift to us and what it means. It's more than Christmas. It's eternity. And that's what I want us to focus on this year. I want us to take time to share with folks what changed your life. To share with folks how you came to the realization that you desperately needed that baby in a manger. And I want this Christmas to be the best possible. The best possible. And our goal is to build up to that so that on Christmas Eve morning in this place, you bring your friends, you bring your families. Let's pack this place out to share the story of the baby in a manger who became the savior of the world. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much. This story is amazing. And I think about it and I just realize you love us so much. I thank you that Jesus of Nazareth 
was the person who fulfilled these 60 prophecies about the Messiah. I thank you that you cared enough about us to make sure that we understood who he was and what he did and why he came. And I thank you for that. Father, I pray that this Christmas be the best Christmas for every person here. Not in terms of, of stuff, but in terms of realization what Christmas is really all about. And for us to have the courage to share that with our families and our friends. I mean, we got people here on this planet we love to death. And truth be told, if we don't share the story of Jesus with them, they'll never hear it. They're going to miss out. I think about some of my friends that are close to me that need to know about Jesus. I look around this room, Father, and I see people in this room have very good friends who don't know the story, who haven't had the opportunity to invite Jesus into their lives. And so, Father, I pray that this Christmas be a life-changing Christmas for those in our lives. You put them there for a reason, and I believe that reason is to help them find you. So that's my prayer this morning, Father. I thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.